Greetings. This is to be a uh, lecture on uh, the problem of evil. Uh, we've been looking at arguments that attempt to prove the existence of God, what I've been calling evidential arguments to prove the existence of God. Now we're going to look at um, uh, two different approaches of evidential arguments which uh, try to prove the non-existence of God. And uh, these different approaches are referred to as the problem of evil, or perhaps more accurately, the problems of evil. So let me share my screen. And if I did this correctly, we should be looking at a slide that says evidential arguments against the existence of God, the problem of evil. Yeah. Now, there's actually two versions of this. There's what is called the logical problem of evil, uh, which claims that uh, given the existence of evil, God is logically impossible. Uh, the idea here is that God is logically incompatible with the existence of evil. Since we know there's evil, then we can be equally certain that there's no God. Then there is the empirical problem of evil. Here, this is making what seems to be a more modest claim that the existence of God is highly unlikely given the existence of evil. But as we'll see, that is actually a more difficult uh, argument to defeat. But one thing at a time. First, we want to be clear on our terms. What do proponents of the problem of evil suggest are the uh, they mean by evil? What is this evil that they are citing? And they usually have two distinct kinds in mind. There is moral evil, which is the wickedness or the evil that human beings do or will. And then there's physical evil, which is the pain and suffering. And this can include both um, human and non-human animals. So the suffering that humans endure or the suffering that non-human animals endure. Now, sometimes this is brought about by wicked, willful action such as uh, an assault or something like that, where one human being assaults another human being or something like this. But it can equally well occur through no intentional behavior whatsoever, just natural disasters like hurricanes or earthquakes or uh, tsunamis or this sort of thing, sickness. First, we're going to deal with the logical problem of evil. The logical problem of evil uh, version claims that evil is logically incompatible with the existence of the O God. That is, that is, rather, it is logically impossible that the universe contain evil, so specified, and the O God. Evil coexisting with the O God is as logically contradictory, they claim, as being a married bachelor, or uh, and, and thus is inconceivable. Therefore, given that there is evil, we can be absolutely certain that there is no O oh God. So why would they say such a thing? Well, here's a layout of their argument, right? If the O oh God exists, then he would want to eliminate all evil. This follows from the fact that the O oh God is supposed to be omnibenevolent, all good. And presumably what omnibenevolent means is opposed to evil. Premise two, if the old God existed, then he could eliminate all evil. Why do they say that? Well, again, from the definition of the O God. Specifically, God is supposed to be omnipotent, can do all that is possible. And so God could eliminate all the evil if he wanted to. Whoops, went too fast. But if God could eliminate all evil and would eliminate all evil, then we move to premise three, uh, if go the O God existed, evil would not exist. And that simply seems to follow from premise one and premise two. However, premise four, evil does exist. We know that there is suffering, both human and non-human animals. We know that there is moral evil, human beings doing wicked, evil things. And so this is evident from our experience of the world. Thus, we move to our conclusion, the O God does not exist. And that simply follows from three, and four. Again, if the O-God existed, evil would not exist. Evil does exist, therefore the O-God does not exist. And you may recall that this is a, a logical um, 
uh, argument form called modus tollens. If P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. So here we have, if the old God existed, he would uh, want to eliminate all evil. If the old God existed, then he could eliminate all evil. If the old God existed, then evil would not exist. Evil does exist, therefore the old God does not exist. This is just a recap of what I just had. Overview. During the Enlightenment and the early portion of modern philosophy, there was a philosopher named Gottfried Leibniz, who was a German philosopher. And he basically claimed that if God existed, then we could be certain that this is the best of all possible worlds. He did believe that God existed. He gave a separate independent ontological argument in the style of Anselm to prove that God existed. Well, if God exists, and this, uh, then this would be the best of all possible worlds. God does exist. Therefore, Leibniz concludes that this is indeed the best of all possible worlds. It's worth mentioning here that Candide, uh, the French satire written by uh, Voltaire, the um, uh, novelist and uh, um, academician, um, basically he uses this uh, novel to make fun of Li this Leibnizian pronouncement. Right? Um, maybe you've read Candide, sometimes it's required reading. But uh, Candide's teacher, Professor Pangloss, repeatedly assures Candide that all is for the best and that this is the best of all possible worlds. Of course, Dr. Pangloss does this despite the many misfortunes that befall Candide. So this was basically Voltaire making fun of uh, Leibniz and Leibniz's idea that this is the best of all possible worlds when assuredly this is not. The problem of evil starts from pretty much the same conditional, but rather than a modus ponens, if God existed, then this is the best of all possible worlds. God does exist, therefore this is the best of all possible worlds. It performs a modus tollens. If God existed, then this would be the best of all possible worlds. This is not the best of all possible worlds, therefore God does not exist. So here we see the problem of evil. Again, it's starting with the sort of Leibnizian idea that given that God is all good, all powerful, um, can achieve whatever he wills, and he wills only that which is good, therefore, this would have to have been the best of all possible worlds if he existed. But it doesn't seem to be that this is the best of all possible worlds. We could clearly imagine a, a better one. Therefore, it must be the case that God does not exist. Now, there are three possible non-traditional or what I call non-orthodox responses uh, to the problem of evil. They are non-orthodox because they contradict the traditional view of God taught by major Western monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. One possible response is simply to deny that God is omnibenevolent. This would explain evil. Evil, God is in some part malevolent or at least indifferent. And so evil arises in the world because God really isn't all good. He might be downright malevolent or he might simply not really care about the world. He's indifferent to the world. But this is non-traditional because it denies the omnibenevolence of God. Similarly, one might deny the omnipotence of God. And this would also explain the evil, right? So God would like to get rid of all the evil, but he just isn't powerful enough to do it. This was William James's view, for instance, right? James thought that God existed, but it's clear that God is not omnipotent. Why? Well, because he wouldn't tolerate all this evil um, if he could get rid of it, but he, he can't get rid of it evidently, and therefore he's not omnipotent. Note, both number one and number two concede that there is no O God right? Both number one and number two concede that there does not exist a being who is all good and all powerful. They're denying either that God is all good or that God is all powerful. I imagine you could deny both. You could deny that God is all good and you could deny that God is all powerful. The third non-traditional, non-orthodox response might be to deny that evil is real. So one might like Baruch Spinoza claim that what we call evil might be called good from another perspective and that all things are good from God's perspective. 
if we could achieve God's perspective, we could see how everything is beautiful in its own way. So as the shark is attacking me, um, that seems really evil to me, but it seems really good to the shark. Right? And then if both the shark and I could achieve God's perspective, we might um, somehow uh, believe that all things are good. The shark attacks and surviving shark attacks, right? Or, like some Christian scientists, uh, they might claim that evil is an illusion and that what we call evil is not really evil and it is not evil and it is um, uh, known to not be evil to the spiritually mature. So once one achieves the proper spiritual perspective on reality, one is not deceived by the illusion of seeming evil. So what are some of the problems with these responses to the problem of evil? Well, again, number one and number two would be deemed heresy by most Western monotheistic religions. To give up on God's omnibenevolence or to give up on God's omnipotence uh, is not consistent with the traditional views about the nature of God. Also, they may render a God who falls short uh, of a fit object of worship. Do I really want to worship a God who is not all good? Do I really want to worship a God who is not all powerful? There seems to be something non-divine about these um, pictures of God that are being rendered. <clears throat> Number three would also be deemed a heresy by most of the world monotheistic religions because they claim evil, whatever its ontological status, is a real force in the world to be resisted and opposed. Notice, uh, the religions uh, claim we are commanded to feed the hungry, heal the sick, comfort the lonely, <laughs> and more so, pardon me, we're called to do so on God's behalf. <coughs> pardon me. And also, what would an omnibenevolent God mean if not opposed to human wickedness? Pardon me, I was having a little coughing spell and I need to take a, um, I need to get a little glass of water. All right, so um, I think where I left off was to say, what would omnibenevolent mean if not opposed to human suffering or human wickedness, right? So what would it mean to say that God is all good, even though God doesn't oppose, I don't know, child abuse? No. I, I, I've, you've loosened my grasp on what you're talking about at that point. Such a response weakens our grasp on the meaning of good as well as of evil. Further, the difference between illusory suffering and real suffering is unclear, since it would seem that suffering is perception dependent. So if I tell you I have a terrible headache, and you say, no, 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 you just think you have a terrible headache, but you don't really have a terrible headache. Thinking one has a terrible headache is the equivalent of having a terrible headache. It simply is the perception. So, so to say that, well, the suffering you are undergoing is only illusory suffering, I don't see how that actually 
eliminates the problem of evil. What are some traditional responses to the problem of evil? Well, the traditional response to the problem of evil is what's called a theodicy. A theodicy is an attempt to defend the character of God against the problem of evil. It's an attempt to show that the existence of the O-God and the existence of evil are logically compatible. In other words, the universe is big enough to contain both. Um, and usually they do this by saying that God has some reason for permitting the amount and the kind and the quality of evil that he does. All theodicies appeal to some good, which is supposed to justify or counterbalance or outweigh the evil. In other words, they suggest that there is a morally sufficient reason. And this is a phrase I'll return to throughout this presentation, an MSR, morally sufficient reason, that a moral God has sufficient reason for permitting the evil that we have uh, about us, that we see and that we are aware of. We will briefly look at four of the most prevalent, prevent, you know, it should be prevalent, theodicies offered. Each attempts to provide a morally sufficient reason why an O oh God, an all good, all powerful, all knowing being would and does permit the evil. To succeed, they must show that the good secured by the evil justifies the quantity and the quality of the evil we see in the world. So those are two aspects to keep in mind. Not only is there a great deal of evil, so there's a great deal of quantity, but it's some of it is very, very intense. So what about that quality of evil? Is that all that is necessary? So is the quantity and the quality both necessary for the good or the supposed good that God counterbalances uh, in favor of? So the first is the free will theodicy, and this may have occurred to you already. The idea here is that God permits evil because evil is necessary for free will. Free will is a great good, necessary for morally praiseworthy actions. It provides human beings with responsibility. It be we become, in a sense, co-creators with God, and this is a great gift, and it's the source of human dignity. Notice also free will seems to be necessary for us to enter into a loving relationship with God. One can't love God if one is commanded to love God. Uh, love seems to require just this kind of free will. We have to do so of our own uh, volition. And not just volition, but free volition. But even so, we might ask, shouldn't God intervene, at least in some cases? I mean, when things are getting really wildly out of hand, shouldn't God step in and say, okay, wait, 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 uh, that's too much um, abuse of free will. You're doing too much evil with your free will, and I'm going to step in. No, they say, because real responsibility requires real consequences. And so if God stepped in every time things got really very nasty, uh, then there wouldn't be real responsibility because there wouldn't be any real consequences. Now, the argument here is that free will is such a good thing that it's worth the price. Again, most often this is used as a uh, explanation for moral evil. Why does God permit people to do wicked, evil things? Because it's a necessary consequence of free will, they say. The second theodicy we'll look at briefly is the soul-making theodicy. God makes this world a rough, dangerous, violent place because only in such an environment can we develop our character and make something noble of ourselves. In a perfect world, there would be no need nor opportunity for ministry, charity, bravery, generosity, perseverance, etc., Further, these opportunities are worth the price. So the idea here is that God makes this world that we live in for the time being a place where there is hunger or there's loneliness or there's disease. Why? Well, because in a place where there's hunger, loneliness and disease, there's op opportunities for generosity. There's opportunities for compassion. There's opportunities for uh, ministry. And so we have the opportunity to be better people because we live in a world that calls forth the need to be better people, compassionate, generous, 
uh, uh, ministering people. And again, the idea is that these uh, opportunities are worth the price. Often this is used as a justification for a physical evil, the suffering that goes on in the world. A third theodicy is the knowledge of good and evil theodicy. Here, the idea is that in a perfectly good world, we would be surrounded by goodness, but utterly ignorant of it, since we would have nothing to con uh, contrast it with. Consequently, God permits evil because it is necessary for us to come to know the difference between good and evil. Imagine we lived in a world where every object in the world was red, so we would be entirely surrounded by red, but we wouldn't know what redness was because we had no medium of contrast. Likewise, in a world where there was no evil, we wouldn't understand the difference between good and evil, and thus we would not realize what goodness is or the fact that we were surrounded by goodness. Fourth, the theodicy is that <clears throat> evil is necessary for there to be good. Some have argued that even an omnipotent God could not create good without at the same time allowing for evil. First, only God is perfect, so whatever he creates will necessarily have flaws. Why? Well, he can't replicate himself. He cannot create perfection. He is perfection. And so any creation he uh, affects were, is going to be necessarily flawed and imperfect. Good and evil, from this perspective, are logical counterparts, they claim, like big and small. Even an omnipotent God could not create a big thing without the same time creating a small thing. Therefore, there, uh, for there to be anything that is big, there must be something which is small. So too, they claim, for there to be anything which is good, there must be something which is evil. The only way to avoid evil entirely would be for God not to create anything at all. But this is less good than creating a world that contains some evil. Thus, the omnipotent, all-good, all-powerful God creates a world which is imperfect, which contains evil, but it's better than not creating anything whatsoever. Problems. Let's take problem uh, theodicies one, two, and three. The free will theodicy, the soul-making theodicy, and the evil is necessary to know the difference between good and evil. <clears throat> One might ask whether or not the good produced is really worth the price. So here uh, you're saying, well, it's a trade-off. Is it worth it, right? Uh, would an all-good, all-powerful God make that kind of trade-off? Should an all-good, all-powerful God make that kind of trade-off? This is a question asked in uh, the novel The Brothers Karamazov by um, Dostoevsky where um, Ivan is asking his brother, Alyosha, um, the following. Imagine that you are creating the fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, giving them peace and rest at last. But it was essential and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature, that baby beating its breast on its fist. For instance, and to found that edifice on the unavenged tears, would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? Tell me, tell me the truth. No, I wouldn't consent, Alyosha softly says. For context, perhaps you know, perhaps you do not, Ivan is the rebel who does not uh, believe in God, or at least does not embrace God. Alyosha is his believing brother. But even Alyosha wants to say that Ivan's giving him a compelling case to say that the bargain, perhaps necessary for this, the, the um, salvation of the world, is not worth it. But there's deeper problems, right? <clears throat> Let's take the free will theodicy in particular. Actual evil is not necessary for free will only the possibility for evil. Let's ask ourselves, is there a possible world in which 
three human beings do not behave immorally. Could we imagine a scenario where three humans, like you and like me, or perhaps more, more specifically, like Mother Teresa, or uh, Mahatma Gandhi, or uh, Martin Luther King, uh, free individuals that have free will, but they use their free will only for the purposes of good. Could we imagine a world populated exclusively by such individuals? Yes, I think we could imagine such a world. Well, if that's the case, why didn't God, using his omniscience, his all-knowingness, right, actualize that world? And he actualizes a world populated exclusively by individuals who do not misuse their free will, but rather use their free will to achieve good exclusively. Such a world is possible, and he is an omniscient, omnipotent deity after all. Why didn't he create that world? Why did he create a world that included people like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin or um, Mao Zedong right? or Pol Pot? Why did he create that world? He did. So such a world is possible, clearly. Otherwise, you're saying that all free beings are compelled to do evil. Not only does this seem false, it certainly is not what most monotheistic religions uh, would want to say. This being the case, an O God would have created that world, that preferable world, and not this one. He would have created the best of all possible worlds, and this ain't it. Therefore, the theodicy from free will does not work. It does not explain why the O God would permit evil. I think I'm uh, so we should still then believe that the o, that no O God exists. What about the second theodicy? Well, the th second theodicy seems to claim that there are certain what we'll call first order evils, suffering, let's say. But nevertheless, these are justified because they lead to a second order good, like charity and compassion. Nevertheless, they also allow for a second order evil, such as selfishness or indifference or cowardice. Now, this leads to potentially an infinite regress about levels of goodness. Even if it's the case that pain, first order, allows for compassion, second order, it also allows for indifference, another second order evil. Does indifference allow for some third order good? And even if it did, wouldn't this simply open the door to some third level, third level evil, third order evil, and so on? So justifying first order evils by second order goods is uh, launching a potentially infinite regress if we acknowledge that there are second order evils. And then what justifies the second order evils? Third order goods? then we just begin the regress anew. Therefore, the theodicy does not work. That is, it does not explain why an O God would permit the evil that we see about us. Also, it seems that this, uh, this uh, soul-making theodicy uh, is no answer to pointless suffering or suffering that actually destroys a person's faith or morals. So it is the case that some people who undergo terrible suffering, the loss of a child or a, a very challenging disease or a great deal of pain and suffering, maybe some uh, disability, sometimes they come out of those experiences saying they have a greater relationship with God and that they're better people as a result. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes those experiences are simply devastating and they experience a kind of spiritual desolation well, how was that suffering valuable to them then, right? When it simply uh, uh, demolished their their relationship with God, sometimes their relationship with family members, etc. It's clearly known that when a married couple loses a child, very often they divorce afterwards because it's just too painful to stay together. So not only did they suffer the loss of the child, they suffer the loss of the marriage and the companionship of their spouse. Also, it seems 
no answer whatsoever to the suffering of very small children, especially when they die young. Um, so if they have a very painful disease that makes them suffer and then they die, how is this of uh, uh, this theodicy explaining why they should have undergone that? Yes, I have the opportunity to be compassionate to the child, but that seems like a nice thing for me. Nevertheless, how does that justify the suffering to the child? It seems like I'm sort of using them uh, and they're getting nothing out of it. Further, it also seems like no answer to the suffering of non-human animals. Think of all the terrible suffering that goes on in the world of uh, animals in, in the forest or, or stray dogs or abandoned kittens. I mean, we can multiply this uh, endlessly. And how are they receiving any benefit since, as far as uh, religions teach, they don't have immortal souls. They don't enter into relationships with God. There isn't an afterlife that they can look forward to. There's just a miserable suffering existence that they have in this world. Therefore, this theodicy, the soul-making theodicy, does not work. That is, it does not explain why an O-God would permit the quality and the quantity of evil that we see around us. We should still, therefore, believe that there is no O oh God. The O oh God does not exist. Number three. Remember, number three was that evil is necessary to know the difference between good and evil. Fine, but how much evil would actually be necessary as a medium of contrast? It doesn't seem we would need as much evil as we actually have. Go back to my example of a red world, right, where everything is red. Well, we don't know what red is since we have no medium of contrast. Well, how much non-red would we actually need? Maybe just a small patch of blue. A small patch of blue to say, ah, I got it. I see the difference now. I don't need more. Well, how much evil would we need to see the contrast between good and evil? Not as much as we have, right? A small bit of evil. Ah, I got it. I'm done now. We don't need any more than this. If that's correct, then this theodicy does not work. It does not explain why an O God would permit so much evil. And we should still believe that no O God exists. One might claim that suffering is relative. If this is the case, then were God to eliminate all current examples of suffering, there could still be perceived suffering. So imagine God removed all, all the most uh, horrendous forms of suffering that we see around us, like bone cancer, for instance. Right? And we lived in a world where there was very, very little suffering by our standards today. Imagine a world where the most horrible suffering is cold soup. Well, that sounds pretty good to us, right? We, oh, I much prefer that world where the maximum amount of suffering that anyone had to endure was cold soup. But realize from that world's perspective, that's excruciating. Why? Because that's the worst they could imagine. In our world, I could imagine a whole lot worse. Well, I don't have to imagine. I can witness a whole lot worse than cold soup. For my money, uh, one of the worst things I could imagine is being burned alive. I don't know. That's something that's troubled me ever since I was a child. And that's the worst kind of excruciating suffering I could imagine. And so cold soup, ugh, I could handle that. But if the worst I could imagine was cold soup, then that would be essentially the equivalent of being burned alive. And I go, oh my God, that's horrendous. So we wouldn't think that cold soup was such a terrible suffering because our world, uh, in our world, far worse things can happen than cold soup. But for all we know, there are other worlds where the most, imagin um, where the most imaginable suffering in the world would be cold soup by comparison. In other words, we could imagine worlds where there's far worse suffering than being burnt alive. I don't care to imagine such things, but I suppose we could. This suggests that any suffering is justifiable and we are not in the position to know what the maximum amount of suffering we see in the world is more than is necessary. So to say, oh, we have more suffering in our world than is necessary, presumes that we could imagine 
<laughs> precisely how much suffering is absolutely necessary. But what if it's all relative, right? So maximum suffering is going to be world dependent. Nevertheless, this still does not really address the issue. Right? Isn't it an impossibly pale response to those who are suffering, uh, to victims of wickedness, where you say, well, you know, it could have been worse, or for all we know, it could have been worse. I'm not sure that that's a satisfying theodicy, a sat satisfying response to the suffering. One might counter that just as the world in which there was only horrible, um, there was only, and one might counter that just as a world in which there was only horrible suffering would be really objectively bad, whether or not any resident of that world knows or could know it, a world in which there was no horrible suffering would be really objectively good, whether any resident of that world could or does know it. Number four. Number four, remember, was saying that evil is necessary for there to be good, that for God to create anything, he has to create something which is imperfect, which has flaws and defects and thus evil. But this is simply not true. Remember, um, all good, non-evil world is logically possible if evil is considered as wickedness or suffering. So remember the, the um, person promoting the problem of evil uh, I, um, defines what they mean by evil. Could we imagine an evil? Try again. Could we imagine a world in which there was no moral wickedness? Yes. A world in which there were no moral agents would be a world in which there was moral, no moral wickedness. And we could imagine such a world easily. Could we imagine a world in which there was no physical suffering? Yes. We could imagine a world in which there was no sentient creatures. So think of the earth before the development of sentient life. There was no moral evil and there was no physical evil. So to say that God could not create a world in which uh, there was no moral or physical evil is simply false. There were such worlds. There are such worlds. And therefore, to say an um, uh, omnipotent being couldn't create one is simply false. It is a true contingent fact that we tend not to appreciate good without a medium of contrast, but that throws us back to theodicy number three, not theodicy number four. If we define evil independently of suffering or wickedness, then one might claim that while there is suffering, there is no actual evil. But this move, too, threatens to loosen our grasp on what we mean by evil. Therefore, this theodicy does not work. It explains, uh, that is, it does not explain why an O oh God would permit evil as defined. Notice it appears to work only by changing the subject. And they don't seem to be talking about moral and physical evil any longer. They seem to be talking about some other metaphysical concept. Extended responses to the free will theodicy. One might deny that God must create the best. God need not create the best. Maybe some better possible worlds exist. It's just not our world. And we're in no position to complain, since were the other world the only one which existed, we would not exist. God has no obligations to people who don't exist and harms no actual existing person by creating them, even if they do not always do what's right and or must suffer. So the idea here is, well, you might simply deny that God is required to create the best of all possible worlds. He's created this one. And are we in any position to complain? No. Because if he created a different world, we wouldn't exist at all. And he doesn't have an obligation to create that world. Those are possible non-actual people to which, uh, to whom rather, he has no responsibilities. And we're the world that was created and we're not in a position to complain. It may be logically impossible to predict that a free being, uh, what a free being is able to, let's try this again. It may be logically impossible to predict what a free being is going to do in advance of him doing it. Therefore, 
while there may exist a possible beings who do not do evil, even God cannot know in advance who they are. If an action is free, even an omniscient being cannot know what the agent is going to do in advance. The objective truth that the omniscient being knows is that the choice has not yet been made. This is a, a, a free will uh, uh, re. This is a defense of the free will theodicy, which is offered by Richard Swinburne. Or one might also claim that um, no such possible worlds are actualizable by an omnipotent God alone. Such worlds are only co-creatable in collaboration with the free agents themselves. Imagine two possible worlds, one where Professor Harris is needlessly cruel to a student, evil Professor Harris, and another where he is not good Professor Harris. What could God do to create the second world rather than the first? What could an omnipotent being do to create the world where the good Professor Harris does not become needlessly cruel to a student and avoid the world where the evil Professor Harris is needlessly cruel to a student? Well, given the nature of free will, nothing. Even an omnipotent being can't create the one over the other. Why? Because it's up to Professor Harris to co-create the one over the other. Right? So God needs the collaboration of his free beings to create that uh, preferable possible world. This is a theodicy offered by Alvin, a free will theodicy offered by Alvin Plantinga. Some have suggested that evil and suffering we confront make no sense, uh, or rather make sense only in the context of the promise of an afterlife. Evildoers are brought to justice, and the suffering in this world is inconsequential compared with the infinite bliss of afterlife, so they claim. Nevertheless, that there's any evil at all still requires some justification. The afterlife answer was called a very curious argument by the philosopher Bertrand Russell in his uh, work called why I'm not a Christian. Quoting from Russell, he says, if you looked at the matter from a scientific point of view, you would say, after all, I only know this world. I do not know about the rest of the universe, but so far as one can argue at all on probabilities, one would say that the probable, uh, that probably this world is a fair sample. And if there is injustice here, then the odds are that there is injustice elsewhere also. Suppose you got a crate of oranges and you opened it and you found that all the top layer of oranges were bad. You would not argue, oh, the underneath ones must be good in order to redress the balance. You would say probably the whole bad, the whole lot is a bad consignment. And that is really what a scientific person would argue about the universe. He would say, here we find in this world a great deal of injustice. And so far as that goes, that is a reason for supposing that justice does not rule the world. And therefore, so far as it goes, it affords a moral argument against deity and not in favor of one. Stray note number two. J.L. Mackey talks about various attempts to explain the existence of evil. And he suggests that all such explanations give up on one of the properties of God. They either end up uh, tacitly denying the omnipotence or the omni omnibenevolence or the omniscience of God. Further, Mackey raises the problem that the concept of omnipotence is incoherent. The very idea of an all-powerful being might itself be an incoherent idea. Can an omnipotent being create a creature whom it cannot control? In other words, a free willing being? No matter how you answer that question, it would seem to lead to a contradiction. If you say no, an omnipotent being can't create a creature whom it can no longer control, well, then there's something it can't do, create such a creature. If you answer yes, then there's something it can't do, control that creature. So again, no matter how you answer the question, it seems to 
suggests there's something the omnipotent being can't do. This is similar to that sort of joke sometimes that people offer. Could God create a rock so big he can't lift it? No matter how you answer the question, there seems to be something that you end up saying God can't do. Create such a rock or lift such a rock. What all these theodicies have in common is that each argues that there's some morally sufficient reason, some MSR, which explains why an O oh God permits evil uh, and attempt to provide such a reason. Perhaps with the exception of Cord Adams, who claims that God need not create the best of all possible worlds. They fail to the extent that they are insufficient, that the good produced is not worth it, or they do not demonstrate the need for the actual or the extent of the existing evil that we see about us. Traditional apologetics. Some have taken a different tact in response to the logical problem of evil. They suggest that even if we have not found a morally sufficient reason for evil, that in and of itself does not demonstrate that there could not be any. The logical problem of evil claims that God is impossible given of evil. This is equivalent to saying that a morally sufficient reason is impossible. So what you're saying is, it is logically impossible that there be a morally sufficient reason for the amount and quality of the evil that we see around us. But apologists say, we can't and don't know that. Apologists suggest that there might be some reason that an oh God permits evil, and we just haven't thought of it yet. The fact that there could be a reason demonstrates that it is not strictly logically impossible that the oh God exists given, uh, impossible rather, that the oh God exists given evil. So we can't be absolutely certain that the oh God doesn't exist, even with all the evil we see around us. Why? Because there might be a reason we simply haven't thought of yet. Imagine this, the, the possible reasons available to an infinite intellect like God is immense, whereas the spectrum of reasons available to finite intellects like ours is far, 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 far more narrow. So nothing's occurred to us which justifies the evil that we see, but that doesn't mean we can be certain there isn't something which justifies the evil we see. And this is known to God. Therefore, the logical problem of evil fails to prove what it claims to prove. It claims to prove that God is logically impossible. Well, it doesn't prove that. Why? Because there may be a morally sufficient reason that we haven't thought of yet. But enter the empirical problem of evil. Uh, I'm going to skip this. It's in the notes. Um... To those who claim that evil is necessary in any world, Hume is making two distinct replies. First, the world is without sentient creatures, would contain neither moral nor physical evil. This is something we've already discussed. Further, we could easily imagine a possible world in which there was sentience and volition, but not as much evil and suffering. What then shall we pronounce on this occasion? Shall we say that these circumstances are not necessary and that they might easily have been altered by the contri contrivance of the universe? This decision seems too presumptuous for creatures so blind and ignorant. But let us be more modest in our conclusions. Let us allow that if the goodness of the deity, and I mean goodness like human goodness, could be established on any tolerable reasons a priori, these phenomena, however untoward, would not be sufficient to subvert the principle, but might easily, in some unknown matter, be reconcilable to it. So, if we could prove the existence of God, a good God, we might say that, okay, look, given our, our limited intellect, um, we can't be certain that that God doesn't exist, even despite the fact that we have uh, all of this evil around us, etc. right? So again, Hume here is conceding that the logical problem of evil doesn't necessarily prove the non-existence of God. 
here so Hume is admitting that for all we know, maybe a better world um, uh, is in fact, the better world that Hume himself is envisioning is impossible. So he's saying, look, I could imagine a better world, but maybe for reasons I don't understand, that's not really possible and God knows better. That is, if we had independent reason for thinking there is a God and that he is omnibenevolent and omnipotent, and if this reason were of a kind to be absolutely certain knowledge afforded by a sound a priori argument for the existence of God, then we might conclude with Leibniz that appearances to the contrary, this is the best of all possible worlds. God knows why it can't be any better, even though we do not. Going on with Hume, but let us still assert that as this goodness is not antecedently established, but must be inferred from the phenomena, there can be no grounds for such an inference. While there are so many ills in the universe, and while these ills might so easily be remedied, as far as human understanding can be allowed to judge on such a subject. I am skeptic enough to allow that the bad appearances, notwithstanding all my reasonings, may be compatible with such attributes as you suppose, in other words, an all-good, all-powerful God. But surely they can never prove those attributes. Such a conclusion cannot result from skepticism, but must arise from the phenomena and from our confidence in the reasoning which we deduce from these phenomena. So he's saying, okay, look, if I look at the world and I see the suffering in the world, does this give me reason to think that this world was created by an all-good, all-powerful God? No. Now, if I had different reasons for thinking there is an all-good, all-powerful God, maybe I can reconcile the amount of suffering I see in the world uh, with the existence of, of such a being. But as far as facts and evidence goes, all of the facts and evidence seem to strongly suggest the non-existence of such a being. That's the nature of the empirical problem of evil. Which hypothesis is most likely given the evil we see in the world? The hypothesis of an all-good, all-powerful God or the hypothesis of a the lack of an all-good, all-powerful God. What Hume and the empirical problem of evil conclude is the latter. Right? Again, given the facts and evidence, the most reasonable conclusion is there exists no such being. Might further evidence arise which overturns this? Yes, that's the nature of empirical argumentation. So if I base my conclusion on experience, it's always possible that future experience might overturn that. After all, we used to think all swans were black. No, change that. We used to think all swans were white. Why? Based on experience. We don't believe that anymore. And why is that? More experience. So it's the nature of empirical arguments that they're probabilistic. But what Hume and the empirical problem of evil here is suggesting is that given the uh, evidence we have at the moment, the most likely conclusion is there exists no such being as an all-good, all-powerful God. Um, imagine that there was an island country that was terribly mismanaged, where there's a great deal of suffering, there was a great deal of corruption, um, there was a great deal of, of, uh, of uh, uh, moral and physical evil. And I said to you, you know, but that country is run by a friend of mine, and I know that he's a very competent, very moral, very upright leader. Saying, but there's all these problems. Is he really an, a powerful, moral, uh, upright leader in, of this country where there's such suffering, there's such corruption? Yes, yes, I'm certain of it. Okay, might I be right? Or isn't it more likely to think that my friend is not powerful or is not morally upright or is not in command or doesn't know what's going on, but he lacks power, he lacks goodness, he lacks knowledge, or perhaps all three. What do the facts and evidence most strongly suggest? Well, the facts and evidence most strongly suggest that my friend is not a competent ruler of this country. Likewise, the facts and evidence suggest that if there is a God, 
It's not an O-God. It's not a God who's a competent ruler of the universe. Right? Does it prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God does not exist? No, that's not its claim. It's claiming that it's far more reasonable to deny the existence of the O-God than to affirm the existence of the O-God, given the facts and evidence. So that uh, concludes my presentation on the problems of evil. I hope this was clear. Naturally, if you have any questions, by all means, please do um, let me know. I'm happy to chat with you about it and uh, answer questions or respond to comments that you might have. But that concludes our um, lecture for today. I wish you a good rest of your day.